with life's less lovely creatures is the foreign visitor to a nation who presumes to diagnose and then prescribe for the ills, real or imagined, which he or she observes in the country being visited. I know that I, as an Australian, fret, fuss and fume when John Kenneth Galbraith and Ralph Nader pay their all too frequent visits to my nation and presume to advise us very kindly as to how we can improve our economic lot. To avoid being labelled by the tag appended to these creatures, I wish in this address to bounce off, so to speak, uh, from some observations beginning not in your nation, the United States of America, but in my nation at home. In 1982, my fellow countrymen, in a moment of what I perceived as a sheer lunacy, elected the Australian Labour Party, a self-styled Socialist Party, to power. Anticipating a minimum sentence of four years hard labour, I listened to my favourite recording of Mozart's setting of the Dies Irae, that is an ancient Christian hymn uh, beginning with the words day of wrath, O day of mourning, and began prayer preparing to hibernate uh, for a long cold winter of soaring taxes, increased welfare payments, further regulation of industry and business, and of course ever burgeoning bureaucracies. My plans for hibernation were interrupted, at least temporarily, when a few days after actually taking the reins of government into their hands, the socialists did two things. They floated the Australian dollar and announced their intentions of deregulating banking. Now, for some five years, I had been a member of an unofficial body which advised those members of the Conservative Party, which held power prior to the advent of the Socialists, urging them to do just these two things. For given a fiat currency, the, as it were, entrusting of that currency to market forces rather than government edict is, I believe, correct. And more importantly, deregulating banking is the first step towards greater economic responsibility. Our pleas to the Conservatives had gone unheeded. Surprise! The Socialists had done what we had recommended. Following the deregulation of banking came a plethora of proposals to deregulate other industries. And the proposals, in dramatically short time, became legislative reality. Then came fairly substantial cuts in marginal taxation rates, the most dramatic cuts being those enjoyed by men and women paying taxes at the highest rate set. Astonishingly, inheritance taxes, which had largely been abolished, by the Socialists' conservative predecessors were not, well, to our surprise, reintroduced. In fact, the last nail in this particular coffin, no pun intended, was driven home by the Socialists. The conditions that an individual had to satisfy to qualify for welfare payments were tightened, and such payments were frozen. Indeed, in one or two cases, the payments were reduced. Double taxation upon dividends was abolished. Such taxation, declared our Socialist Prime Minister, is monstrously unfair. The latest Socialist proposals relate to the privatisation, that is, the selling off to private enterprise, of such government-owned industries as Qantas, 
telecom, that is, the Australian phone system, and so on. Now, old-style Australian socialists are not a little bewildered by this new brand of socialism. Such confusion, such bewilderment, is compounded when one listens to our, again, self-styled socialist prime minister and socialist treasurer expounding the virtues of competition, investment, capital formation, and, in general, the private enterprise free market economy. Indeed, I find myself beginning to wonder just what the adjective socialist means when the self-styled socialists gigglingly dismiss as utterly irrelevant such practices as the central planning of an economy or extensive regulation of various enterprises. It's all, to me, as a Lewis Carroll fan from way back, reminiscent of Humpty Dumpty's remarks to Alice in Alice Through the Looking Glass when he says, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Oddly, Australian socialists are not sui generis, are not one of a kind, when it comes to a willingness to look with newly sympathetic eyes at freer markets. Austria, for example, is considering selling off 49% of once nationalised, that is state-owned, industries. France, with a socialist president, has sold off four of the nation's largest socialist enterprises and plans to privatise 65 of such industries, enterprises in all. Regardless, it would seem, of the alleged ideological commitment of whatever party happens to be in power, centralised collectivist socialist in the old sense planning seems to be on the way out and freer markets coming into their own. The most startling manifestations of this trend are, of course, the very public flirtations with freer markets by the Marxian leaders of the USSR and of China. Now, speculation as to the significance of Mikhail Gorbachev's stated proposals to reform the Soviet economy is rife, and rightly rife. The fundamental nature of the reforms he proposes is clear. Profits and incentives are being described as crucial to economic efficiency. Economic decisions once entrusted to the army of socialist planners staffing Goss Plan, so-called in Moscow, are being transferred to factory managers and others. Indeed, perhaps the last word on this was spoken by Tony Benn, one of the radical left-wingers of British politics, who stated after a recent and fairly protracted a visit to Moscow, that, and I'm here quoting, what Gorbachev is saying is that the old central planning has ended up as a nightmare. I think, added Tony Benn, again a self-styled socialist, I think Gorbachev's right. Now, precisely what is happening in Moscow is, some would say, anybody's guess. After all, we do have precedent. Once upon a time, Lenin moved from so-called war communism, which was socialism pure and simple, to what he called the new economic plan. This is around about the 1917s, 18s. And the new economic plan did involve a greater reliance upon freer markets, a reliance, as it were, negated, destroyed by Stalin. But whatever doubts you and I may rightly have with the USSR are, I think, lessened when we look 
at communist China. For China's experiments with freer markets are much further developed than the experiments taking place in the Soviet. I suggest, if you're interested, that you look at a volume of essays penned by mainstream Chinese economists, a volume entitled China's Search for Economic Growth, published by the so-called New World Press in Beijing. Without exception, the essayists stress the importance of capital formation, the need for incentives, and perhaps most importantly of all, the sheer impossibility of old-style central economic planning. Indeed, as a matter of fact, the essayists proffer a new or relatively new definition of socialism. And what is that definition? From each according to his ability, to each according to his work. Astonishing. Now, if this statement surprises, another statement in a volume, The Myth of the Plan, let me put that on the board. The Myth of the Plan, penned by a self-styled US socialist, Peter Rutland. Should amaze us. For what does Peter Rutland say? He says in his second chapter that he, as a good socialist, naturally defends a Hayekian, that is, a, according to Friedrich Hayek, free market economy. And why does he come out with this extraordinary, from a socialist's viewpoint, statement? Well, he says, it's only in a free market economy that the most important commodity of all, that is, information, is made available to all the people. In a planned economy, he suggests, it's only the planners, an elite, a political elite, that has, maybe, the information necessary to plan a people's economic activity. But, says Rutland, in a free market economy, that information is available to everybody. For it's right out there, encoded in changing relative money prices. The free market, he says, represents the, his term, the socialization of information. Therefore, he concludes, I, as a good, loyal socialist, defend a free market. Now, this should worry you Americans more, perhaps, than it worries me. For you see, you Americans have a long history of concern for linguistic exactitude. Let me turn back the clock and go back to the distant days of Noah Webster of Webster's Dictionary fame. There's a story, and I'm assured that it is true, that the good Noah was one day caught by his wife when he was in the act of embracing, hugging, kissing the family maid. Mr. Webster, said the affronted Mrs. Webster, I am surprised. Oh no, my dear said the good Noah, you are amazed. It is we who are surprised. The point I'm trying to make is this use of the noun socialism, this use of the adjective socialist is extraordinary. Yet it's a usage that we are finding more and more and more in articles, volumes, penned by our alleged socialist opponents. Look, the bottom line, I think, is simple. From Melbourne, Australia, to Moscow in the USSR, from Paris to Peking, disenchantment 
with centralised socialist planning seems rampant. Old-style, old-fashioned socialists almost overnight have found themselves perceived by all and sundry not as daring revolutionaries on the cutting edge of human thought, but as tired members of a dated establishment uh, holding back the world as they cling to the discredited dogmas of socialism's great yesteryear. Indeed, Professor Richard Ebling of the University of Dallas recently made the point and made it well. For, he said, the century which began with talk of centralised economic planning as a promise on nearly everybody's lips has ended as the century with talk of centralised economic socialist planning as a bad taste in nearly everybody's mouth. Facts. Now I wish to explore with you in this address two questions that are generated by these facts. My first question is this. What has happened that has led to this, I think, dramatic change in socialist emphases? And the second question, can you and I, men and women, excited by, committed to, attracted by human liberty, take great comfort from this change? I think that the first question I raise, why this dramatic change? is easier to answer than the second. And I want to divide my suggested answer into two sections. Firstly, the answer given by socialism in practice. Secondly, the answer suggested by socialist theory and the collapse of that theory. But let's turn to practice. At the beginning of our century, Socialism, that is modern socialism, was by and large a theory, a pipe dream, a vision, a blueprint. To be sure, the planned economy has historically speaking been the norm. The extraordinary truth of human history is that from the year dot we have records of men and women entrusting their lives to political planners. Yet, Marxian socialism, Fabian socialism, modern socialism is basically a creature of the late 19th century and a creature which at the beginning of our century was largely a theory. Yet during this century the theory has been translated into reality. The bare bones have taken on flesh and countless variations upon the old standard socialist formula have been tried. And the outcome of each such trial has, I suggest, been disaster. Now, I have no desire here today to rehearse thoroughly familiar material. But let me explore with you two cases, two cases which I think typify the experience, the known, the, the tasted, the sensed experience of this century. And I take two countries. I take firstly Tanzania. And I'm focusing upon the third world simply because you and I tend, still instructed by the left, to feel guilty about what has happened in third world countries. Back to Tanzania. Tanzania, within living memory, my memory, and I believe I am living, Tanzania, within living memory, once exported maize. It was a country self-sufficient in food. It was an African nation where men, women and children were beginning to truly enjoy the good life. But then a political change occurred. 
Julius Nyerere, a self-styled Christian socialist, was elected to power. And in the blessed name of agrarian reform, Julius Nyerere did what his socialist advisers, advisers from the West, by and large, told him to do. He collectivised agriculture. Now what happened? In spite of the fact that the area has been, perhaps unkindly, called an aid junkie, despite the fact that Tanzania was the recipient of more foreign aid than any other third world nation in the world from your nation, uh, the USA, within a decade, that nation was reduced to utter dependence upon foreign aid for the most basic, the most fundamental, of foodstuffs. Nyerere socialised, nationalised 300 industries. Within 10 years, over half of those industries were bankrupt. They didn't exist anymore. And of those that remained, the majority were functioning at a loss. That is, absorbing raw, more raw materials, ah, the givens of nature and human labour, intelligence, what have you than their output warranted. Productive output per worker declined some 50% in that decade. And the bureaucracy increased at the rate of 15% per annum. Now get that. That means that the size of the bureaucracy doubled in round about six years. A once prosperous nation, where there was sufficient food for all to eat, sufficient clothing for all to wear, sufficient shelter for all to enjoy, reduced to destitution in less than a decade. Thanks, I submit, to the dutiful and faithful application of one variant of the socialist formula. But let's take a contrast. And I choose not a third world nation, for there are such nations that embraced an essentially free market economy in toto. I picture, I focus upon an essentially socialist nation, namely India. For in 1946-47, India secured independence from her British colonisers. At the time of independence, India, again advised by gurus from the West, embraced an essentially socialist economy. Agriculture, once again, turned out the, the pulse point, where the disaster wrecked by socialism made itself known. For what happened? From 1946 onwards, agricultural output went down, down, down. And in fact, in 1968, in this country, the United States of America, Paul Ehrlich, a once respected biologist, penned a book called The Population Bomb. And in that book, in I think the second chapter, he informs us solemnly that everybody, who is aware of the case, agrees that India could never be self-sufficient in food. As a matter of fact, he quotes with some pleasure an alleged expert on agricultural economics, a Dr. Louis Bean, a very good name, I would have thought, for an expert on agricultural economics, but quotes Dr. Bean to the effect that food production in India, in the years 1966-67, represented a maximum. There was no way, stated Dr. Bean, with the imprimatur of Paul Ehrlich, that India could increase on that output. But then something happened. In 1972, having tried almost all available alternatives, the government in India, as a sort of a mad experiment, decided to deregulate, effectively, agriculture. From now on, the government said, the decision as to what crops will be sown and then harvested will be made by the local farmer. And presumably, 
he will make that decision by reference to his best information as to what crop will yield him maximal profits. Worse, from the socialist viewpoint, the government said to ensure that he takes this seriously, we will cut marginal tax rates paid by farmers. So any increased productivity expressed in money terms, he will largely retain. One more step. We will, said the government of India, abolish all price controls on foodstuffs. And at that decision, the socialists international, socialists everywhere, screamed in protest. Are you to allow food, that most basic of commodity, to be, as it were, controlled by market prices? Yes, said the Indian government, let's try. What happened? The year 1978, the screams of socialists deploring this betrayal of socialist principle were, in, were joined by a few other screaming voices, Australian voices as it happened. These Australians were angry. India, they proclaimed, is no longer importing as much Australian wheat as it used to. The chorus was joined by a few American voices. Hey, said these voices, India is no longer importing as much American-grown wheat as it used to. Seventy-nine, seventy-nine, eighty were the magic years. For in those years, India actually began to export grain. And today, if you amble into any university, state or private, and you go to the magazine section and you procure for yourself and you peruse any journal on major agricultural issues emanating from India, you'll find one topic dominates. And that topic, how do we store surplus crops? In less than a decade, the free market, which basically means the removal of the fetters upon human creativity and human imagination, had worked. And that nation which the experts had said never will be self-sufficient in food was experiencing a glut, a surplus of foodstuffs. Incredible. Now, we could amplify the story. We could look at what was once known as Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. We observe that little island nation, self-sufficient in food in the days of the free market prior to independence. We observe that nation utterly dependent upon foreign aid for foodstuffs in the days of Bandra and socialism. Then we see the same nation nervously embracing the free market under Jaradine, and in six years regaining self-sufficiency in food production. But the story, the story in a sense is too well known to bear repeating. The general point that I would make and the general point that socialists have taken seriously, even if you and I, as defenders of the free market, times have underrated, is that when socialist theory is fleshed out in terms of socialist practice, the result everywhere at every time has been disaster. Hence I suggest the first reason why the socialist wizards of my homeland Australia, or Oz, as we fondly call it, the socialist wizards of Oz, have, as it were, been mugged by economic reality. Whenever and wherever socialist principles have been tried, socialism has failed. 
But strangely more interesting to me because I tend to live in my head and in the world of theory. More interesting to me is the collapse of socialist theory. And in talking about this, I want to zero in on three distinct areas. And my order may perhaps strike you as strange. I want to start off with the historians. I want then to move to the self-styled Marxians of the world today. And then finally, this sounds odd coming from a speaker employed at the Foundation for Economic Education. Only lastly do I want to live, look at economic changes. But let me begin with some history. If, if we want to understand what certain historians that I'll be highlighting, stressing, and perhaps, ju perhaps jumping up and down about are saying, we can perhaps buy into what they are saying and why it's important by considering a rather general proposition. And the proposition is this. It's that you and I, ordinary human beings, tend to ask questions of what is strange, what is unusual, what is unfamiliar. What do I mean by that? Simply this. I wake up in the morning, I sort of stretch, I get my coffee, and if truth be told, I have a cigarette, then maybe I peer out the window. And I see, let's say, a bird in flight. Well, I have no questions. I'm not puzzled. Ah, oh, so that's just a bird. But if one morning were I to look out my window and see a man flapping his arms, perhaps in flight, even if I'm in this country and the man has a big S on his T-shirt and a red cape, I am bewildered, I am puzzled. This is extraordinary. So I immediately race to my telephone and I get on to the local New York call-in radio station for I'm told that is where I must turn in this country for true wisdom. And I ask my questions. I'm puzzled by this unfamiliar reality. Now it seems to me that you and I, beneficiaries, often the unknowing beneficiaries of a market order, have learned to regard abundance material plenty as the norm. We wander into the local supermarket, we see the groaning shelves and the bulging freezers, and oh, we say that's just the way things are. Or we pick up a magazine and we learn that the approximately 3.9% of the American working populace directly involved in agriculture manage by their efforts to feed an entire nation and a great deal of the rest of the world. Oh, we say that's interesting. I must store that little fact away. I could perhaps use it in trivial pursuit. But it's not surprising. That, we say, is just the way things are. The puzzle, the unfamiliar reality, the unusual state of affairs, hey, we say that's destitution, poverty. Hence our question, why poverty? Why is it that some people find life a struggle for existence? Because surely the norm is abundance. Now, in talking this way, in thinking this way, we reveal, I want to suggest, our historical ignorance. For the fact is that the vast majority of human beings that have ever walked this earth have found their life an ongoing, continuing, usually unsuccessful struggle to survive. Destitution, famine, starvation, that, historically speaking, is the norm. That's the usual state of affairs. 
When you and I pick up our newspapers and look near Christmas at a picture of a starving African child, you and I, whether we know it or not, are looking at a picture uncannily reminiscent of the picture that might have been taken of our great, 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 great ancestors. For the vast majority of human beings, I repeat, who have trodden this earth, life has been nasty, brutish, and short. An ongoing, ceaseless, and by and large unsuccessful struggle for the bare necessities of survival. But you see, you and I forget. We forget for a number of reasons. In part, we forget because of the gracious realities of literature and mythology and song and legend. For these realities tend to celebrate men and women who lived well, but ignore those who lived in the dark, dank, terrifying world of destitution. Indeed, literature may even suggest to us that the ages of agony of yesteryear were well, ages of pastoral simplicity. Well, believe you me, they were not. They were terrible, dire times. Times that you and I, as I say, forget. As we forget such simple facts, as the fact that in 1780, 90% of the French populace spent a full 80% of their income on bread and bread alone. That in the year 1800, life expectancy in France was 24 for males, 27 for females. <clears throat> that, if you like, is the norm. The puzzle, the perplexing fact, the oddity, the freak of human history is that once upon a distant time, abundance became the norm. Material adequacy from the good earth became a reality. Now to understand what happened and why it happened, I find myself greatly indebted to two French historians. Two French historians who typify a whole new school of historical research. And it's a very hard-nosed school. It's a school that demands that its facts are accurate. It's a school of thought that virtually counts, if it could, the grains of wheat available in different ages as people till the earth and plant their wheat. And the two representatives I want to think with you about are Jean Bacler and Fernand Braudel. Now, not all the writings of these two thinkers have been translated into English. In, if my memory serves me right, 1975, Jean Bacler's major work, The Origins of Capitalism, I repeat the title, The Origins of Capitalism, was translated and made available, published by Oxford University Press. In 1986, Fernand Braudel's masterpiece, Civilization and Capitalism, 15th to 18th century, was translated into English and published in this country. Three volumes. Oddly enough, it's this thinker, Fernand Braudel, whose work I'm going to draw on in what follows. And I do so for a delicious and ironical reason. For you see, Fernand Braudel, two decades ago, was widely regarded as the bright-eyed boy, the promising hope of contemporary Marxism. But Fernand Braudel, who was a historian before he was a committed Marxian, did his homework, got his facts, and said farewell to the terrible world of, of classical Marxism. Oh, he still talks about, as it happens, capitalism as a bad thing. 
But the astonishing thing is, he said, the alternative to capitalism is the free market, which is what you and I and other lovers of liberty mean by capitalism. He's still using the old-fashioned Marxian notion of so-called late capitalism, which perhaps you and I would describe as fascism. But that's a bit of an aside. What's the story that Baker Braudel tell? Now, I have to simplify. And I can only urge you to read for yourselves, and I imagine you'll read, as I read, the works of these thinkers with trembling and eager hands. They're marvellous works. I can only summarise, simplify what they're saying. But basically the story they tell is this. From the beginning of recorded history, from the first time when we have some idea what the lot of humanity walking this earth was like, there's an old story to be told. A community, either by intelligent research or more frequently by accident, discovers some new technology, some new way of behaving that increases economic output, that leads, if you like, to economic growth. But let's simplify that. A community discovers a way, let's say, to get more food from a given acre, two acres, what have you, of soil. For a time, that's good news. The output of the soil, the produce of the good earth, increases, and more people survive and live longer. And a people gave thanks. But then, the cosmos played a cruel and seemingly inescapable sort of joke, a sick joke. But what happened? More people survived, yes, but that meant the population rate began to increase. And the rate at which population increased soon overtook the rate at which agricultural output increased. And the end state of that community, of that people, that nation, was just as it was at the beginning, if not worse. I mean, look at the figures. We look at communities that, for some reason, escape the decimation we know as the Black Death. And to our astonishment, those people at the end of the time when the Black Death reigned, the reign that they were, as it were, protected from, those people were worse off than other communities that were decimated. You see, population was a problem. There was, if you will, a grim sort of Malthusian trap from which escape seemed impossible. Get the picture. New discovery. Increased agricultural output. More people survive. Great news. But then the horror. Population rate of increase outsoars food rate of increase. And the end state is worse. But then, according to Baker and Braudel, let's focus on Braudel, things changed in two places at one time. What were the places? The answer is the Netherlands and England. What was the time? Answer, early 16th century. For Baudel, actually, little aside, is saying that the beginnings of capitalism, I'm letting the cat out of the bag saying that, go earlier than many of us thought. Some of us have even stupidly identified the beginnings of capitalism with the Industrial Revolution. But no, says Baudel. The Industrial Revolution was not the cause of capitalism or the emergence, it was a child of capitalism. The free market, the free society began, he says, 16th century, England and the Netherlands. For what there happened? Well, these nations chanced upon or discovered, who knows, new ways of increasing the output of the soil. We've heard that before. Agricultural output increased and more people survived. Well, you say, so far, so familiar. 
The population began to increase. Oh yes, you say, and perhaps you yawn. The old, old story. But then the twist for the rate at which economic output increased kept way ahead of any increase in population. In fact, something new happened. Each new birth was celebrated as a new source of creativity and wealth rather than just another consuming mouth to be fed from dwindling resources. Sustained economic growth and work out what that term means. An ongoing increase in goods and services per person had become a reality. And Baekler asks the right question. Not why poverty, our question, but how come this historically freakish phenomenon, how come that in these two little nations at this one particular time, sustained economic growth was a reality? Now you see, the agony is that the old answers don't work. There was no new technology available in the Netherlands or England that was not available to other European nations. Again, England and the Netherlands did not enjoy greater natural resources than did other nations. Neither had some empire being exploited, as Lenin, Hilferding and others would teach us to believe. What had happened? What was different about these two little nations at this one time? Brodel, and I remind you that he is or was a hardcore Marxian, but a better historian than he was an ideologist, says there's only one reality. I can point to. Jean Baekler agrees. And numerous, Douglas North in this country, numerous historians who have also looked at this area are agreeing there's only one answer. And I think we can be confident about it. It's not controversial. For what did these two countries at this time have? They had a new system of property rights. Now, admittedly, it was only in embryonic form. But the child, and indeed the adult, could be seen in that tentative beginning. And what was coming to birth there is the system of property rights that you and I know as private property rights. When that system was born, the old agony of the ages the Malthusian trap that had haunted, tormented and teased humanity from its beginnings had been escaped. And that astonishing reality, material abundance, food sufficient for all to eat, clothing sufficient for all to wear, shelter sufficient for all to know comfort, had been realised. In short, the free market and the free society were coming to birth. Now I would love at this point to show why it's so significant that this ex-Marxian has made this point. I would like to explore with you the reasons why what he has discovered utterly puts an end to Marx's theory of history. Because you see, let me put it very simply, just for those of you who happen to be interested. Marx taught that what is real, what is sure, certain, tangible, holdable, what you worry about in any society if you want to understand change is the economic basis and what he calls the relations of production. That is, the relation of owner to property, of lord of the manor to serf, you name it. What is real, said Marx, are the tools the economic structures that exist, and the relationships between people and things that make up an economy. That's real. If he says there's a change in laws, or political structures, or religion, or morals, or ideas, well, he said, that's caused by a change from this material basis, the economic basis of a society. Economic basis. 
Any changes observed, let me clean the board, any changes observed in the worlds of law or political structures, let's just say poll for politics, or in religion or in morals, that's messy, go down, or in morals or in ideas, Changes in this area, the so-called superstructure, are caused by economic changes. But you see what Bordell has shown? The most startling, the unprecedented change that shattered and changed the whole direction of human history. The change that Bordell points to and Baker confirms and so many agree. The change that matters, the change from destitution to abundance, the change from poverty being the norm to plenty being the norm, the change that took place that was exciting was not caused by any changes in tools or economic structures or relations of production. The changes that mattered were up here. Changes in law, a new system of property rights. Changes in politics, the structures necessary to enforce property rights. That is, minimum but efficient government. And oddly, these changes came from changes in religion and ideas from the Protestant Formation, Reformation, from the Renaissance went the wrong way. It was changes up here that caused changes down there. Not what Marx said, changes down here causing the seeming changes, the throff and bubble of alteration in this world of flickering lights, passing fantasy that is the superstructure. Marx, if you like, has been turned on his head, but I digress. The important point in what I'm trying to say is this. Socialist theorists always laid a great stress on history. The best historians of our age, the most exciting thinkers of our time, are agreed that the norm was changed from destitution to plenty when a new system of property rights, the system, if you like, in its embryonic form, which in time gave birth to what you and I know as private property rights, came into being. And in a sense they're underscoring what sound economists for decades, indeed hundreds of years, have said. The key to material abundance is private property and the private property order. Now that's so crucial. The key to the free market is not voluntary exchange. I exchange a good or a service with you, you give me in return some good or service you have. That's as old as human history. People discover that. It's ubiquitous. People have always exchanged goods and services. That's not new. Markets in the narrow sense, again, they're as old as the great city-state of Athens or of Biblical Jerusalem. For what were the great cities of humanity's yesteryear if they were not markets where people met to exchange the few goods and services they had? The key to a market economy is a system of private property rights in which not some but all goods and services are owned by individuals. Secondly, a system in which no subset, no class, no caste is denied the possibility of acquiring property. And the third point is that these property rights are precisely defined, efficiently enforced. That's the key to the market, private property. And when, as it were, the cosmos yawned and gave birth to this new child, we saw the ending of the bad old days. We saw the exorcising, the abolition of the grim spectres of recurrent famine and of struggle and of agony and of early death. 
That, say the historians, the best historians of our day, is the reality. And you know, perhaps I'm kinky, but I find a perverse delight that the historian making out this case most powerfully, most cogently, most intelligently, is, as I noted, a man once hailed as the bright-eyed boy of contemporary Marxism. For he's the one, I submit, that has done to Marx's theory of history, his materialist theory of history, the theory that said ideas don't matter. He has done to that what Bomboic and others did to Marx's economic theory. Socialist theory, in short, has collapsed in the area it was once seen as strongest, namely history. Now, along with this are two other features I want to talk fairly quickly with you about. I'm going to be dropping book titles everywhere, but I just want to keep these points short. They're perhaps not as important in a funny sort of way or as dramatic as this historical change. A change, I stress, that has underscored what sound economists always have said. But you see, concurrent with these new insights of the best historians has been the collapse of classical Marxism and indeed classical Marxism-Leninism. Now look, I could talk about this for hours, but let me just briefly summarise the significance of what has happened. Let's start with a poll, Lesik Kalikowski. He was to philosophy what Braudel was to Marx in history, the bright-eyed boy. He was the person who was proffering the most cogent defences of classical Marxism in Poland. But then he began to have questions and doubts, and he was an honest man. But his honesty drove him out of his homeland, and he went to Oxford, and there he published, 1979, three volumes that any person who takes liberty and the arguments for liberty seriously should procure and study, demanding though these volumes be. The work is called Main Currents of Marxism. Three volumes, and they're heavy, they're demanding, but who said life's meant to be easy? I don't believe it is. We're meant to do our homework. Three volumes that I believe challenge Marxism as it has never perhaps been challenged before. In a sense, it marks the end. Now, that's a pretty strong statement, but I'm going to underscore it. But alongside Leszek Kalakowski of Poland came French thinkers, Jean-Francois Revel, Bernard Henri Levi, and they wrote books not on the theory of Marxism, economic and philosophical, but books on the practice. And they said the notion that you can have Marxism, that you can have socialism with a human face is nonsense. They challenged those Marxists who said, look, the horrors of Stalinism, that's an aberration of true Marxism. They said, not so. It is inevitable that that happens. And their works I also commend to you. But most of all, and look, as I say, I could talk on this for hours, I beg of you to read what the most intelligent, the most thoughtful, the most honest, the best informed, self-styled Marxians themselves are saying. I just mentioned two of them. Here we've got a bit of space. G. A. Cohen of Oxford University. John Elster, who graces the United States of America for six months by his presence and then goes home to Oslo. Two men whom I regard as the sharpest, most perceptive, the best informed self-styled Marxians of our day. And as a general rule, may I say this, never look at a position antagonistic to your own at its worst. Look at it through its strongest defenders, and these two men are well, you say, well, so what? Just this. Cohen and Elster disagree on many points. But on one point, they're in complete agreement. Hey, they say, Marx's socialist economics are bunk. They're wrong. They're finished. They've been falsified. So, fellow Marxists, forget 
that side of Marx. You say, I don't believe it. Because economics is so crucial. The Marxian approach to economics is so vital to Marxism. Well, I can only say, read. Read what Elster is saying. In, for example, uh, his volume, Making Sense of Marx. This was published in 1986, Cambridge University Press, in conjunction with the Institute for the Study of Humanities in France. And in that volume, he simply says categorically, forget everything Marx ever wrote on economics. Specifically, he refers to what many would see as the linchpin of Marxism, the labor theory of value. Hey, says Elster, and here I'm quoting word for word, check me out. He's saying, the labor theory of value is useless at its best and dangerous at its not infrequent worst. And if this volume, which runs for some 500, 600 pages, is a little bit daunting, read a shorter book that he published this year, 1987, Karl Marx, An Introduction, also Cambridge University Press. His final chapter is headed, What is Live and What is Dead in Marx? And in the part, What is Dead? He puts down Marx's theory of history. He knows Braudel and others have put an end to that. But he also lists Marx's economics. It is, he says, nonsense, an embarrassment to be forgotten. Now look, I could go on. I'm intrigued by the number of Marxists who've been reading what Hilferding, Lenin, Bakunin, and a whole lot of contemporary thinkers said about imperialism. I mean, you know that story. You've seen the signs, American imperialists go home, or Yankee imperialists go home. Following Lenin, Hilferding, other Marxian thinkers, imperialism was seen as bad news. Hey, this story goes, we of the West are wealthy because we exploited those nations we colonized yesteryear. Because we, if you like, exploited in the past and continue to exploit in the present third world nations. Your most able Marxists are saying, Lenin had it wrong. They're going back to the early Marx, the early Engels, because do you know what the early Marx and the early Engels said about imperialism? They said it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. We like it because it's forcing primitive, Marxist word, vegetative economies into capitalism. And that means it'll be sooner rather than later that they make the final step to socialism. But that's another story. So-called imperialist theory, or what in the silly 60s and 70s was resurrected as dependencia, dependency theory, the notion that we of the West got wealth by exploiting the third world. The Marxists themselves at their best are saying, rubbish, throw it out. There is a crisis in Marxian thought. And let me just whisper it. I have this funny feeling that one Mikhail Gorbachev of the USSR knows it, knows it better than do those dreadful figures, those horrible refugees from the silly 60s who managed in your country and my country to find sanctuary in university departments of sociology and not a few theological seminaries. That's where the old star Marxists are. They've never hit, as it were, the collapse of classical Marxism, but it's happened. And the best Marxists know it. History, let me summarise, historical research has gone in a non-Marxist way. Marxian theory is facing a crisis of unparalleled intensity and agony. And thirdly, the world of economics has changed. As it happens, this is my 18th visit to the United States of America. And when I first came here during those silly 60s, 
There was no doubt that in your mainstream universities, there was basically one approach to economics that was seen as the approach that mattered. It's what some people call the neoclassical Keynesian synthesis. Others would call it as general equilibrium theory, but basically it was an approach that said, look, laissez-faire capitalism, the free market as traditional understood is finished. We have to have intensive and extensive government intervention in the economy to get economic stability, growth, what have you. There was this one approach. Now, I don't want to say too much on this, because if I were to say as much as I would like, it's two lectures, not one. But frankly, the unchallenged reign of neoclassical Keynesian synth synthesis, the neoclassical Keynesian synthesis, is finished. It finished when something that had never happened before, and which Keynes said could never happen, did happen. When you had inflation, as it were, at one time with recession. Theoretically, could never have it, you did. Keynes' formulas collapsed. And what's exciting, your best economic thinkers, your youngest economic thinkers, and the most able today. Monetarism, associated with Milton Friedman, very much in its basis, free market. You have the, the interesting, as it were, speculations of public choice theory. James Buchanan, the American who won just last year, the Nobel Prize in Economics is pointing to the simple fact that the assumption of Keynes and his followers that government intervention, political control of economy will bring that economy more to general equilibrium will, if you will, be in the public interest is nonsense. Hey, say the public choice theorists. Politicians remain economic creatures looking after their own interests. And they, as it were, if they're allowed to try and control an economy, will control it in ways that benefit them and special interest groups knowing what they're getting. We could go on and on. For all its extravagances, supply-side economics challenged the earlier Keynesians and at least reminded us that at the heart of economic reality is the individual, the thinking, choosing, valuing, acting individual. And they reminded us of something we shouldn't have forgotten. The glib talk about increased tax rates leading inevitably and inexorably to increased tax revenues is so much nonsense. Because the way the individual choosing person begins to value leisure as against labour when the fruits of his labour are stolen from him changes. And if we were wise and I did say that uh, this supply-side economics had an extravagant side, but at its best, if we were wise, it reminded us of the great insights of the Austrian school that always stressed that the very heart of economic reality lies not abstractions like interest rates or an abstraction called tax revenues or tax rates or average wages, what have you, but the thinking, valuing, choosing, creative, individual human being. What I'm trying to say, terribly quickly, absurdly quickly, and we've ignored a whole lot of different uh, schools of so-called economic theory that we could discuss that are fascinating, rational expectations theory, all sorts of approaches. The important point is this, whereas the presumption in the silly 60s, early 70s, was that it is those who defend the market who are on the defensive, and are under attack. Today, I submit it's gone the other way. It is those men, those women, who still cling to the discredited dogmas of yesteryear, and who believe that government control, political control of a people's economic well-being leads to prosperity, who are very much backs against the wall trying to fight empirical evidence and clear thinking. In economics, Things have gone, I submit, our way. Well, I can imagine someone saying, this sort of optimistic chit-chat should mean that you're a very happy man. But just relax with me for a moment, that word optimistic. You know, the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. A pessim an optimist 
is a person who believes, the story says, that we live in the best of all possible worlds. Uh, the pessimist, it has been added, is the person who thinks that optimist might just be right. Or even better, a pessimist is a man who believes all women are bad. Uh, the optimist is a man who hopes the pessimist is right. But let me move from that suggestion that maybe I'm being unduly optimistic, however you define it, to my final word. Can I, as a person who defends, who values, who cherishes liberty, cherishes freedom, find comfort from the fact that more and more socialists of yesteryear have, to adapt an old phrase, been mugged by economic reality? Can I feel that this is a harbinger of victory, if not victory itself? And let me tell you quite simply that the most I can force myself to do is to proffer one, perhaps two, feeble cheers. Let me put it this way. Rightly or wrongly, what leads me to embrace, to defend, to cherish and to advocate a free market economy is not primarily the material abundance that such an economic system and only such a system demonstrably generates. What matters most to me is that this and only this economic and political system turns in the last analysis upon the free choices of free people. If you see, in a market economy, decisions as to what is produced, by what means, in what quantities, at what prices and for whom, ultimately reduce to the ordinary humble everyday decisions of individual men and women to buy or to refrain from buying this or that good or service. And those decisions, in turn, revolve upon what the individual human being values more, values less. It's only the free market in the free society that unleashes the literally unpredictable creativity of every man and every woman. It's only such a system that takes with desperate and passionate seriousness the importance of the freedom of all people to dream their own dreams and to strive to make their dreams come true, to formulate to plan their own visions of the good life, and then to act in ways which they calculate and hope will lead to their visions becoming a reality. For you see, as I see it, as I read my history, as I, a foreigner, look at this, your nation, this was the emphasis, an emphasis not upon prosperity but upon liberty, that, if I may use a word mangled by too many shallow thinkers, is the American way, properly understood. If you see, the American way, properly understood, has a very, very long history. It's a history that began in ancient Israel, with the insistence that no earthly power or authority can be treated as all good or all knowing or all wise or all present. And the further insistence that the humblest of human beings possesses a worth and a beauty and a value and a creativity that no ruler may with impunity forget or deny. It's a history going back to Athens of the 5th century BC, where a word that had never been heard before, a word we transliterate, isonomia, was heard. A word that literally means 
the rule of law. And what did that word mean? It meant that no longer, no longer shall a people be ruled by a tyrant's whim or a mob's caprice. Rather, an entire people will be ruled by general principles of just conduct, which apply equally to all, to ruler and to ruled alike. The history that is ours gave birth to that great constitutio libertatis you and I know as Magna Carta, which made the power of kings subservient to law. It's a history that spoke in the impassioned prose of a John Milton and the measured reasonings of a John Locke. It's a history that thundered in your Declaration of Independence, which in its substance so far exceeded its title. In your Constitution, which built security amidst the portents of catastrophe. And in your Bill of Rights, which in a very real sense completed what Magna Carta began, proclaiming as it did that no human being is by nature the servile pawn of anyone, least of all of a government human hands and human minds have fashioned. That history that incredible history, that history that is your history, is not primarily about a blueprint, blueprint for material abundance, but rather is about human freedom and the human imagination when it's set free, and human creativity, which almost as an aside give birth to such abundance, and which historically saw the ending of the terrible dread reign of the grim spectres of destitution and of plague and of famine and of pestilence. And it is that which the socialist wizards of Oz, as I have called them, have yet to understand. I give thanks to God that I have lived to witness the disillusionment of the left with socialism as traditionally defined and with the welfare state as until recently it was understood. Yet I cannot rest for the vision that moves me, the dream that inspires me, the commitment that holds me has not to do with wealth but with freedom, not with the, the fruits of the earth but with what St. Paul calls the fruits of the Spirit, the first of which and the chief of which is that creativity, that imagination, which in the language of my faith I know as the Imago Dei, the image of the creativity who is God that burns in every man in every woman and in every child. Thank you for your attention. The ideas of freedom, as they relate to the meaning and the welfare of the individual, have been clearly expressed throughout time, from the ancient Greeks to our founding fathers, and now many voices among us today. But not so long ago, in the years just after World War II, the voices expressing the freedom philosophy were few and isolated. It was a low point for the philosophy of limited government, free markets, and the private property order. The array of forces proposing various forms of socialism and the welfare state were being heard everywhere. The case for individual freedom was virtually unknown. One 
man in particular saw the need to gather the voices of freedom to provide a broad-based institutional framework. And so, in 1946, the late Leonard E. Reed and a few of his friends organized the Foundation for Economic Education to bring coherence, structure, and life to the ideas of liberty before it was too late. As Leonard Reed and his friends so clearly perceived, socialism was on the increase, not because it was right, but because no alternative was being heard. Voices for the Free Society had no platform from which to offer a positive alternative that was consistent, easily understood, morally correct, and intellectually exciting. The Foundation has been a significant force in changing that situation. Over the last 40 years, more than any other organization, the Foundation, for fee as it is known to its friends, has acted as a first source, an introduction to the philosophy of freedom. While others have concentrated on policy studies, Fee has maintained a commitment to basic principles, the ideal concept, always making the connection between economic education, moral and spiritual development, self-improvement, and the philosophy of freedom. There has been a profound and telling change in the public awareness of freedom both in the United States and around the world. Now the ideas of individual freedom of choice, limited government, a free market economy, and private property rights are again claiming our attention. Much of this success can be attributed to fee and to its effective efforts over the years in advancing the causes of liberty. Fee set in motion a chain of events and released a number of people in that chain of events and those those people have made a significant impact on what we understand about freedom today but what actually is fee and how has it been so instrumental in giving new life to the freedom philosophy first fee is an ever-expanding circle of students of liberty people from every sphere of life who seek to understand and practice the principles of the free market private property, and limited government. These people then take the opportunity to impart to others the excitement of what they have learned. I truly believe that without economic freedom, there can be no personal freedom. And I think, if anything, that education uh, for me has come from, from fee. Second, he is the oldest of the freedom institutions, and it continues to be a leading voice for liberty, having affected more people and influenced more institutions and organizations than any other freedom enterprise. Third, Fee is a committed board of trustees, featuring some of the most principled freedom devotees in America, people who study, practice, and are dedicated to the philosophy of freedom. And fourth, Fee is a highly dedicated professional staff who coordinate a broad range of integrated programs. Programs like publishing. Some people supporting the freedom philosophy will find themselves more attracted to one rather than the other, but show the range and really be pointing out that the foundation is equipping people who belong to any one of these. Sound ideas are the most effective counter to the seemingly compassionate arguments of socialism. Part of Fee's mission is to discover and draw attention to the sound ideas and economic principles that underlie the free market through a large and expanding publishing program. Since January of 1956, the magazine The Freeman has been published by the Foundation on a monthly basis. This study journal has gone to thousands of individuals for the asking. The Freeman, originating under the supervision of Paul Perot, is the oldest of the journals written from a free market perspective. As a matter of fact, when virtually no one else was interested in advancing free market ideas, the Freeman was quietly presenting its case to students, teachers, clergymen, and business people. And Fee presents that case through longer, more in-depth publications like The Law by Frederick Bastiat, The Mainspring of Human Progress by Henry Grady Weaver, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, 
Anything That's Peaceful by Leonard Reed, Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, and hundreds of others. Over the years, Fee has sold or given away millions of copies of various publications. Prices, free market, prices, direct production. You know, once in a while you may wonder that in this capitalistic system without a central plan, without a central brains in washing, telling 200 million Americans what to do, and yet there's a marvelous order of things in economic life, a very rational economic order, and, and without a central plan. And all this is achieved, accomplished, through the signal of price. Seminars. In the interest of more concentrated times of study, each year since 1952, hundreds of people have come to a wide-ranging program of fee seminars at Irvington, New York, as well as regionally throughout the country. In these focused times together, Fee staff and guest faculty give participants an in-depth look at the freedom philosophy or present the freedom perspective on some topical subject. Soon or late, concludes Keynes, it is ideas which are dangerous for good or evil. End of quote. These people, as we know, worked hard and they believed that the products of their labor belonged to the individual producer which is the basic idea of the free market economy. Uh -oh. <laughs> this scenic estate on the Hudson River, just north of New York City, provides an ideal setting for person-to-person -person interaction, for those who are perhaps new to the freedom philosophy. Suppose one of you were offered a job that had wonderful working conditions, the young are often among those to whom the principles of freedom are new. For that reason, the fee staff have developed programs to take free market economic education into the colleges and high schools, with speakers willing to talk to entire student bodies, classes, or small discussion groups. And fee continues to reach young people through its undergraduate seminars, correspondence, debate materials, essay contests, and attractively priced books. What makes FEE different from other organizations dedicated to promoting the free society? Not just the length of time that it has been active, not just the quantity and quality of its publications, not just the seminars and classes that it presents, but its insistence on fundamental self-education and application. Rather than directly confront the people who imply that a free society can't work, the fee approach is to help individuals confront the ideas that are contrary to liberty by emphasizing the importance of basic philosophy and principled economic understanding. Only individual change can truly change society. Freedom is not licentiousness. Uh, freedom is acting in a moral or a responsible sense because to the degree that free will is exerted without a, res a sense of responsibility, then instead of expanding freedom, uh, freedom is destroyed. The foundation for economic education through its many program activities is dedicated to individual freedom of choice, private property, and the free market economy, which makes it possible. Thousands of people all over the country support our efforts. We sincerely hope that you will join forces with these many freedom devotees and let us send you a sampling of our materials. Simply write to us, and we'll send you our monthly journal, The Freeman, along with descriptive material about our activities. Please write to Foundation for Economic Education, 30 South Broadway, Irvington, New York, 10533. Thank you.